with just how insane and shamelessly corrupt the Republican Party is, it's really easy to forget that the Democratic Party is also corrupt and they also need to reform. And a couple of articles surfaced this week that really demonstrate why we have to keep the pressure on the Democratic Party. I know that a lot of people feel inclined to just instinctively run towards the Democratic Party and accept them back with open arms, but we can't do that. We still have to keep the pressure on and demand that they reform. So one bit of news that we got was that the DNC actually named a new interim CEO, and that individual is Mary Beth Cahill. Now, according to DNC Chairman Tom Perez, she's a, quote, seasoned Democratic veteran who brings decades of experience and public service to managing and electing Democrats up and down the ballot. And her goal as interim CEO is to help rebuild the broken Democratic Party. So, that sounds great. The only problem is that we can't buy what she's selling because her history shows that she is a Clinton Democrat who has worked literally for the Clintons. Not only is she a Democratic Party strategist, but she actually was a consultant to Priorities USA, a super PAC that vocally supported Hillary Clinton in 2016. Now, additionally, you all know about the DNC Unity Reform Commission. They voted on reforms and basically progressives already had to compromise, right? They had to compromise and come to an agreement with Hillary Clinton supporters because they were outnumbered. The DNC Unity Reform Commission was stacked with DNC officials that were appointed by Tom Perez and Hillary Clinton. There were just eight delegates that represented the Bernie wing of the party. So they basically came up with these reforms and they submitted it to the DNC for a final vote. And guess what's happening now? The aggregate DNC, they're stonewalling. They're taking their sweet time. They don't want to vote on these reforms. Even though these reforms aren't sweeping and they could have gone a lot further, they're still dragging their feet, intentionally so, with these reforms. As Stephen Rosenfield of Alternate reports, the grassroots-led Bernie Krat wing wants the reforms adopted as a package without further delay or modifications. In contrast, longtime party officials say the package is moving through a standard process and will next be vetted by the party's Rules and Bylaws Committee. The Rules and Bylaws Committee will decide whether to amend them before presenting them to the full DNC for a vote. On Friday, Our Revolution, the campaign organization created by Sanders campaign leaders, sent out an email launching a campaign and pushing for swift action to adopt the reforms as is. One longtime party leader contacted by Alternate rolled her eyes when hearing about the Bernie Kratz demands, saying the faction was impatient, does not understand the process, and that it's a mistake to turn this effort into an all-or-nothing equation. Now, when it comes to a comment made by Massachusetts Party Vice Chair Debbie Kozakowski, when told about the latest campaign to pressure the DNC, she was blunt. She says, I think they're going to yell and scream, and that's unfortunate because it doesn't get you anywhere, Kozakowski said. So they're condescendingly implying that progressives are throwing tantrums because we don't really understand how the process works and we're impatient with the process, but really... What they're trying to do is they are attempting to water down these reforms that were already a compromise for progressives to begin with. As Norm Solomon, a representative of the Bernie wing, states, the whole concept was a negotiated reform package. Once they start breaking the package apart, they're going to slice and dice, and it's going to be a friggin' mess. But make no mistake about it, they're delaying because, of course, they want to vote it down. That's why the Rules and Bylaws Committee is picking it apart. Who do you think's on the Rules and Bylaws Committee? It's all loyalist to Tom Perez. He appointed people like Donna Brazil to the Rules and Bylaws Committee who are actually in bed with the Democratic Party establishment. There's a really important reason as to why Tom Perez purged progressives last year ahead of this reform recommendation. It's because he didn't want anyone like James Zogby who would support this outright. He wanted to make sure that he had his cronies there to pick it apart and water it down. So by the time it's actually adopted, we get basically crumbs. We get nothing. That's what this is about. But that's really all that the National Democratic Party is doing. Of course, they're still hesitant to change. They're still stonewalling. But state parties are also doing their part to make sure that progressives never get power and the establishment stays in power. So as Michael Sonato of The Real News reports, California Democratic Party shields top Democrats from primary challengers. Now, what does he mean when he says that? 
Well, for example, Stephen Jaffe, the primary challenger to House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi in California's 12th Congressional District, acquired the necessary 20% threshold of signatures to prevent the California Democratic Party from formally endorsing Pelosi. Jaffe acquired signatures from 37 out of 182 eligible delegates and submitted his petition with a $350 fee before the 5 p.m. deadline on January 17th. The California Democratic Party rejected the challenge, later claiming there were 190 eligible delegates and that 38 signatures were needed. Another Democratic Party candidate, Maria Estrada, met the petition requirements to challenge the party's endorsement of House Speaker Anthony Rendon, who represents Assembly District 63. After she filed the petition, which had one more signature than the 10 she was required to receive, letters were sent out from two delegates asking that their signatures be revoked, though no procedure exists to allow signatures to be removed from a petition. Estrada's campaign suspects that Rendon, or his campaign, formally contacted the delegates to pressure them into writing the letters. So, they're moving the goalpost. That's called cheating. They tell Stephen Jaffe, who's a very progressive person, I, I've had him on the show, he's a phenomenal candidate, they tell him, well, if you don't want us to officially endorse Nancy Pelosi, then you've got to get 37 signatures. He gets 37 signatures, they say, well, now you've got to get 38. They are absolutely shameless. And can you guess what they're going to say if he gets 38? Well, now you've got to get 39. They're going to make him jump through hoops because they can't follow their own rules and they don't care about their own rules. They just want to make sure that they shield corporate Democrats like Nancy Pelosi and Anthony Rendon from progressive challengers. And when it comes to Maria Estrada challenging Anthony Rendon, this is the guy who campaigned as someone who was in favor of single payer. And what did he do as Speaker of California's House? He unilaterally shelved the bill, made it so that way they can't even debate it. That's what they're doing. This is how the party cheats to make sure the establishment stays in power. But it's not just California. When they don't directly cheat, they'll just go to great lengths to run smear campaigns on progressive candidates. We saw what they did with Keith Allison. He was called an anti-Semite. Now we're seeing a campaign similar to the one that Republicans launched against Obama, now being used by the Democratic Party establishment against a progressive named Abdul Al-Sayed. So Abdul Al-Sayed is running to be Michigan's next governor. He supports a $15 minimum wage. He wants Michigan to have their own single-payer healthcare system. He wants to rebuild the state's crumbling infrastructure. He wants to make colleges free for families earning under $150,000 a year. He wants to legalize marijuana, move towards 100% renewable energy by 2050. He's as progressive as politicians come, and he's an excellent candidate. Now, his opponent is a corporate Democrat named Gretchen Whitmer, and when you look at the issues she supports, you get mostly nothing but platitudes. So, for example, when you see education here, she states that good education is the foundation for the growing economy. And when it comes to healthcare, she states everyone has the right to affordable healthcare. But you see these little learn more links there, and when you click on them, you don't learn much more at all about policies. In fact, you get more platitudes and vague policy commitments. So clearly, Abdul is preferable for progressives uh, in comparison with Whitmer. But I mean, the Democratic Party, they don't really even have to worry about Abdul because even though he's a strong primary opponent to Whitmer, she's still leading in the polls by double digits. She already has the advantage, right? But can you guess what they're doing to discredit Abdul? So they launched an all-out birther-like movement to discredit Abdul by questioning if he is even eligible to run for governor at all. So as Zaid Jalani of The Intercept reports, the Michigan Constitution provides that a candidate for governor must have been a registered elector in this state for four years prior to the election. El Sayed grew up in Metro Detroit. He played high school sports and started medical school at the University of Michigan. He completed his medical education in New York, but returned to Detroit in 2015 after being tapped to lead the Detroit Health Department. While we knew the attacks were coming, we didn't think they would come in the form of insider Democrats using Trump's birther tactics, the campaign said in a statement. The lawyers and Democratic officials interviewed by Bridge, the magazine that published the smear on him, say that his time in New York and the fact that he has a driver's license in that state means he does not meet the basic qualifications for office. Except that the argument they're making is 
incorrect. It's just the smear. He is qualified to run because he's been a registered voter since 2003. And as the article states, Michigan's constitution mandates that a governor must have been registered in this state, a registered elector in the state for four years prior to the election. Well, he satisfies that requirement. So what's the deal? What's the excuse for Democrats smearing him, saying that he's not eligible, basically launching a burther esque movement against him? Well, this is their excuse. They're saying that they have to launch this burther esque campaign against Abdul because if he wins the primary, then Republicans might launch a similar burther esque campaign against him. So they have to defeat him now using the same tactic that Republicans might use in a general. That's seriously the excuse they're using. This is what they do to not only shield Democrats in power, but stop progressives from winning elections. This is someone who would be an incredibly popular governor. You just have to look at his policies. What does Gretchen Whitmer stand for? We don't really know because she doesn't talk about policies. She would be an empty suit there to just do whatever the establishment wants. And of course, they want more puppets. They want people who are going to listen to the donors like Gretchen Whitmer will. So... I'm talking about these different stories because we can never lose our sense of outrage and we can never forget just how terrible the Democratic Party is, even though it's easy to do something like that, just forget about their shittiness because of how bad the Republican Party is. We have to keep the pressure on Democrats. We have to constantly demand change from them. And if they're not going to change, then we've got to go elsewhere. And I don't think we should wait for them to change. I think we already need to do everything we can to build up a viable third party because even if that party doesn't become viable, if candidates from that party, like a Green Party, can't win, well, then that still keeps the Democratic Party in check by threatening their electoral prospects. They don't want a third party candidate spoiling elections. They're not playing fair. We're not getting a fair shake. So we shouldn't be worried about attacking corporate Democrats. I don't know if you guys saw what Joe Manchin did. He basically called on people to not campaign against their opponents. His opponent is a progressive, Paul Jean Swearingen. He's basically saying, hey, I don't want anyone to attack me. Well, we're going to attack you because you've made yourself a target because you're not representing your constituents. You are beholden to large multinational corporations and billionaire donors. So no, we're not going to be quiet. So the Democratic Party thinks that voters are going to run back to them with open arms, and maybe that's the case. But they need to know that progressives will never not be a pain in their ass. We will always be a thorn in their side that will make sure we call them out every time they do something to screw over progressives. So this is completely unacceptable. They should be ashamed of themselves, but they have no shame. They're shamelessly corrupt, and all they're doing at this point is prolonging the inevitable. Progressives will, in fact, take over, and their asses will be kicked out. So they can try to cling to power, but currently, we are grabbing them by the feet and we're pulling them away and they're hanging on by their fingernails. They're doing everything they can. They're kicking and screaming. But we will win this fight. Support this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash humanist report.